All right, sir. All right. So we're back at it in the lab with some instrumentation for chemistry. Start here with the small guy. This is our DR5000 from Hawk. It is a UV vis spectrophotometer. What this instrument does is there is a high powered laser back here that you can adjust the wavelength at which it fires in a specific beam of light. Uh, wavelength is all, it's measured in nanometers, so typically 400 to 700 is the visible range, but that's the uh, UV range, ultra ultraviolet range, or below that, I'm always going to mix it up, whatever. I'll say that range you can't see, there's infrared and ultraviolet, whatever. Point is, every chemical on the planet will absorb light at a very specific wavelength, uh, optimally. So for us, we can use this machine for or this instrument for testing bitterness, uh, for color, IV, I said I use uh, diacetyl, protein, carbohydrates. We do things like copper content and that kind of stuff as well. Uh, it's been experimental working on around here for other things. But very much universal for a lot of really neat tests. It's a little tricky to set up some of the experimentation. It's what they call white chemistry. It's a lot of tedious prep work and um, standard curves and making new ratios for known concentrations. Long story short, this could do a lot of cool stuff using something called a QVET. A little less container. Uh, this one's glass. We also have ones that are UV. This is for the ultraviolet range. Uh, we use this for IU testing primarily. That's measured at 275 nanometers, which is low end. So they, uh, these are just little vials. Little vials, yeah. These little. are quartz. Uh, these are glass. We use different ones based on this wavelength you're looking at. Okay. Short. Uh, so so you, you just put a sample of beer in that? You can. So if you're doing color, that's the easiest thing you do is you put a sample of beer in, measure it at a specific wavelength, and do some math and measure SRM. That's it. Darker beers require a dilution because they're too dark for light to pass through. Uh, all this, how this operates, light, uh, light will shine through the sample at a specific wavelength. Once it hits the sample, It'll, it'll either be absorbed or pass through. This, and here, has a detector that will measure the absorbance. So the higher absorbance means, the higher, the higher absorbance of a specific wavelength of light means the higher concentration of the chemical of interest. So we're looking for a diacetyl, for example, we measure that at 530 nanometers. The more that's absorbed, it means there's more diacetyl in solution. And we do a standard curve, well, I'll start with a pure concentrated diastole sample at a specific concentration, and then do a serial dilution. So we have a range of anywhere from 10 ppb up to, I think we do 200 ppb. And I'll measure about five of them. That's known concentrations. Get the readings, plug it into just an Excel sheet to create a standard linear curve. And when I do an unknown sample, I can see, measure the absorbance, and track on that curve where the concentration actually is. Uh, it's a very almost, standard method for that. Almost every beer has a little diastole. It's, yeah. It's just yeah. a matter of is it at a uh, perceptible level. Exactly, right? yeah. And yeah. Then is it getting into that level that's bad? Exactly, yeah. And, and yep. that's, but there is trace amounts in just about every beer, even if you don't taste it. Sure, yeah. Correct? And that's, uh, that's taste threshold, that's more sensory panel, but yeah. in general, they say the threshold for diastole is about 20 to 30 parts per billion. Uh, some people are a little better at it, some are worse. But it's also dependent on the beer style. So if you ever see off flavors that talk about the threshold number, uh, typically it's in parts per billion or parts per million, depending on the compound. But diastole is usually around 30 parts per billion. That's in a light lager. Uh, in an imperial stout, you're talking 150. So it's very much dependent on the beer style itself and what else is in there. So that's why we always say the hardest beer style to make is the lightest beer styles because there's no room to screw up. You always, yeah. you know, front and center what's in that beer. Then there's always the confusion, you know, between like some caramel and toffee, like exactly. malt flavors. Yep. yep. And sometimes it, it'll mesh with hops and, uh, and barrel the beer, and it just tastes. It'll taste like diacetyl, mm -hmm. but may not be diacetyl at all. Yeah, uh, barrel character is a big one. I always get a. There's, yeah. there's certain yeah. bourbons that throw off a lot of butterscotch. Yeah. It's buffalo not diacetyl. Trace, buffalo Agreed. trace, a lot of butterscotch. Yeah. It's not, it's diacetyl, not diacetyl. It's just a butterscotch flavor compound. Yeah. That's when you got to look for the slickness on the tongue. Mm -hmm and see if the two elements are both there. Exactly. Right? Yeah. If you don't have the slickness, and, and also, it, it, that butterscotch is a little different. It is, it's very but, subtle, and yeah. it's tough, it's training, and, or you just have an awesome lab guy that has one of these things, yeah. and you can measure the numbers, so. So if you, don't, if you don't have it, again, <laughs> what was that called? That was uh, this is a UV Viz spectrophotometer. Okay, and if you don't have one of those, uh, mm -hmm. how else would you uh, check for diacetyl? 
Yeah, one of the easiest tests to do, and we don't do this every now and then with new beers. When I pull that 500 mil sample out of our fermenter, I'll take off some of it into a smaller container that's only 100 mils. Uh, same thing though, plastic screw top container. Fill up about halfway, so about 50 milliliters of beer is all you really need. And then I'll heat it up. Uh, easiest way for me to do it is I'll get a bucket of hot water from a hot liquor tank. It's about 170 degree water, probably 160 once it actually hits the bucket. And I'll let that sample soak in there for about 15 minutes. What that does is the heat is an accelerant or a catalyst for the reaction, uh, converting the precursor to diacetyl, which is a compound known as alpha acetolactate. And it'll convert that into diacetyl uh, within those 15 minutes. After which you pull the sample out, cool it down, sn and sniff it. This smells like butter, it means you still have a lot of diacetyl or a lot of the precursor of diacetyl still in fermentation that you need to pair up. Yeah. Uh, if it doesn't smell like butter, it means it's, it's done. You're good to go, you can probably move on with it. Yeah. So a real, a real simple test that just about anybody uh, can do yeah. and you can do this uh, unscientifically with just a sample and some hot water um, but there's also I will share with you sort of a white paper uh, version of this sous vide uh, uh, test yep. that Jim Matt who yeah. used to work here yep. uh, I know he, he, he wrote kind of a little formula and a plan that has exact volumes that he uses mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a kind of very specific way of doing this test, but you don't have to do that. You could just take a sample, heat it up, yeah. and see see what you smell. That's, it's always best to have at least two people smell it. Um, I, no one person is as good as a whole panel, so the more people to smell it, the better, but if you're trained on it, it's one of those things. If you're not trained on it, get a few people to work on it together. If you are trained on it, I always have at least one other person sniffing with me if I'm doing this test. Right. Just just to cover all our bases. Yeah. And I think you were going to say something else. I was, yeah. Uh, you, did you probably lost it? I did lose it. That's all right. Yeah. Come back to it. Yeah, I will. I will. You'll probably think about it. Yep. Diacetyl. Diacetyl simple test. Simple test. You always want to... I think you were getting... I was going to say, say oh, you always want to have two people smell it. I guess where I was going uh, Maybe that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. all it was. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next all right. piece of equipment. What this we got back is the there? big one. So a UV vis spec. I mean, if you're doing five thousand barrels a year, that's a good piece of equipment to kind of invest in for a lab. What's that? This the, the spec. Yeah. The first These one. are fairly. I mean, new ones are eight grand. Used ones for about five. Uh, again, we've had this for seven years and no issues with it. Yeah. I replaced the light bulb once. It works really well for a long period of time. And uh, it does. It does a lot of tests for it. Mm -hmm. A lot of things. Uh, if you want to get more accurate and more scientific, once you start hitting the thirty to 50,000 barrel mark, this is the type of equipment you want to start investing in. This is a Headspace GC mass spec, or Headspace with a gas chromatograph and a mass spectrometer. So this these is, are three, three mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of modules here. Uh, can the use be used independently, or they uh, kind of have to be used together? They kind of need to be used together. All so. Right. The way this works is you will take a sample of beer. Uh, this is a sample of Oktoberfest, sitting around for a while. Uh, there's five milliliters of beer in here and about an eighth of a teaspoon of salt. Uh, salt. What that does to sodium chloride, salt is an ionic compound. Once you mix it with beer, it creates this, the solution turns to a very polar solution. So a lot very of the very what solution? polar, P-O-L-A-R. Yep, it's a chemical term for how likely things are to react with water. Uh, beer is 95% water, so being a more polar, it'll change the polarity of the solution and allow some of those volatile esters and aldehydes and alcohols to be released more easily into the headspace. So notice these are only filled by halfway, as we call this a head, headspace sampler. Uh, there's a little elevator in here, a sample will drop down into this unit and it'll get heated up uh, to whatever temperature you want to heat to, either set to 85 degrees Celsius. Uh, the boiling point of ethanol, or maybe most aldehydes, is about uh, they're in the 70 degrees Celsius range. So as you heat it up, you have all these volatile chemicals congregating in the headspace of the sample. After which a needle, a little syringe will inject, and only go down a few millimeters and just collect a sample of the gas in the headspace. Not, 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 not in the liquid itself. After which that gaseous sample will travel through the headspace into the gas chromatograph. This is the machine here. And on the inside, I'm gonna open this up real quick. Okay. So we get a shot of that. There's a, com there's a copper coil. It's 30 meters long with a 0.25 millimeter inner diameter. So it's a capillary column is what it's known as. The sample will go through this column and those columns are designed based on whatever compounds you're looking for. 
So I can use this for beer, I use this for a lot of volatile spirits. I cannot use this for oil or gasoline or things that are just very different from beer. There's several columns that are specific to the types of compounds you're interested in looking for. So this one's geared towards esters, alcohols, aldehydes, all those flavor compounds that can make beer taste good or bad. Uh, so, so basically, you have to buy a mass spec designed for beer. Uh, just the column itself. The so this column, whole thing, is, column, this thing can be used yeah. for whatever. The kind of columns are a thousand bucks. So you could you could swap so them you out. Get a, if you get a good deal on this, but you might, have to, but it was used for some other industry. Totally fine. You swap the column out. You, you gotta swap the column. Out. That's all you have to do. Yeah. Okay. And they're fairly easy to change. They're kind of time consuming. It's about a half hour, maybe 45 minutes to do it right. And you're on a calibration <laughs> system, so it'd be a full day turnaround to swap columns out, which uh -huh. is, we don't do. So yeah. Uh, after which, uh, the sample will travel through this column, which so will it, So it's still in the, um, are we just talking about a gas now? Yep. Or the, it's the all whole, gas the whole right file now. is going through there? Just the gas. No liquid goes through this whatsoever. All right. So just we the extract gas. the gas, yep. now we're shooting the gas through yep. that column mm -hmm. on the inside. Okay. So this being a gas chromatograph in chemistry, chromatography is the chemistry of separating things. Uh, gas chromatography really translates to separating the gases. So in that single gas compound, uh, there are many, many, many upwards of 300 different types of chemical compounds. And they'll all be separated based on the size of the chemical compound and its electrical charge. And that's the product of the column itself. So after things are separated, uh, think of it this way, if I'm trying to throw balls down an alleyway, what's going to be easier to get down there, a tennis ball or a bowling ball? Right? It's take much less energy to get a tennis ball down there than a whole bowling ball. So the lighter compounds will travel through first, heavier compounds will follow afterwards. That's where this comes in. This is a detect this is our mass spec, our mass spectrometer. This is what will detect different compounds based on their mass and their charge. And it's a whole very complex chemical process involving a little discharge of ions. Uh, electrons will be thrown at these compounds that cause them to kind of refract at different angles. If we go back to the tennis ball analogy. If I want to throw a tennis ball across the room, I could either throw a ping pong ball at it to try to get off course, or I could throw a bowling ball at it to get throw it farther off course. Um, that's maybe not the best analogy, but you kind of, you kind of get the idea. Yeah, you, you get, get the, the idea that yeah, things will curve point. at different angles. A lot more than I'm going to talk about. A lot of physics involved, and that's kind of boring. Point is, at the end of it, your result in a, in a chromatogram. This is an example of WEMAC. Uh, each of these peaks are different types of chemical compounds that have been detected in this sample of beer. Uh, start with this first one, it's just oxygen. Yep. There's always a little oxygen left in the product because I do this open air, so whatever. The big one here is ethanol, don't care too much about that. We start caring about stuff down this way. So 16 here, peak number 16, uh, it'll spit out a graph. It'll tell you the similarity it is to a specific compound. This is saying it's ethyl acetate, which it is. We know that it's ethyl acetate. That's one, the most, that is the most common ester in all beers. Uh, at high levels, it tastes kind of like nail polish remover. Yeah, solvent tea. Solvent tea, yep. At low levels, it's just kind of fruity. So you always want a little bit of ethyl acetate in your beer. Uh, to go further down, something like this. Uh, this is isoamyl acetate which is the compound that smells like bananas. Uh, very heavy in Hefeweizens and Belgian beers. That's your bubblegummy banana flavor. It's still present in pretty much all beers, just at much lower levels. The bubblegum flavor comes, or banana flavor comes in at around five parts per million. Uh, most of our beers, we see a level of around one to three ppm. Uh, our Hefeweizen this year came in at nine ppm, which is great, so it's very banana-y, which I like. All of this is compared to a internal standard. So this standard peak here is a compound known as 1-octanol. It's a high level alcohol that is never ever found in beer. And I throw this chemical into our samples at the same concentration for every beer we do. And the standard curve is based off of this. Oh, so all of these I peaks see. are based relative to this additional I internal see. standard. Yeah. Which is something that's never found in beer. That, that way you, you know that you have a, a benchmark. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, that you're you're measuring everything against, and that's sort of also a calibration. Yep. Thing. So then you have all this data, amazing amount of data, and I I assume then you're using this to you've identified the levels that you want, 
uh, perhaps the ideal levels you want through a combination of the sensory panel actually tasting the beer uh, and doing the instrumentation testing, uh, you're able to figure out the levels that are most desirable. Yeah. And then you're, yep. so you're constantly doing this testing, tracking it, and trying to hone, trying to constantly hone in uh, on those numbers that you know are ideal for your beer. Yeah, it's a very much synergistic play between our sensory panel and the chemical analysis. I could give you a great report, but that doesn't mean much unless we're actually tasting the beer as well. On the flip side, we could taste our beer and say, hey, this is really nice. Why is it so nice? What's, what's in here? What made this beer taste the way it does taste? So these two sections work together to kind of give us a fingerprint of all of our, at least our house beers that we do all the time. Say, hey, these are acceptable ranges for all these types of flavor compounds that we've agreed are an average of what we see normally versus what our panel says is a good beer. If we see something off, we kind of look back here and say, hey, why was this beer not so great? And I think I have an example. This one. A uh, good example here is a couple batches ago of Pachanga. We had an issue with it we weren't super happy, super happy with. You see this peak right here, right in the middle, it's kind of large. Compared to what we see normally, where it's almost nothing at all, right? Uh -huh. It peaks at sea all the time. And we went back and oh. found out, this was the fourth batch of Pachanga that was brewed that day. So it's the very last round of yeast that was pulled, meaning it made it, we might have got hit beer instead of yeast. So we pitched too little yeast. Uh, one of the products of pitching too little yeast is some stress, which produces a flavor known as a sea aldehyde, which is your green apple, vegetable, pumpkin-y kind of thing. Um, so we knew that. We, we, we tried the beer. People say, hey, something's off at this. Can't quite put my finger on it. Looking back at this, hey, this is a real thing. Went, went back to the beer and said, hey, guys, do you get a sea aldehyde out of it? Yes, that's what we're tasting. Now you say it out loud. Uh, so we only kind of trace back what the problem was with that. So now going forward, we need to hook up a site glass we're looking for pulling yeast for pachanga because what should have been enough yeast in there clearly wasn't for whatever reason. So for us now, we're set just blind faith in hoping that we're going to get enough out of it. Uh, we're going to hook up a site glass and actually look and see what we're pulling through. As and then this the also breaks. gives you sort of a <clears throat> sort of a benchmark of what level is acceptable mm -hmm. and when you have hit that limit. Exactly. Of, yeah. Of what's not acceptable yep. uh, for your own standards. Mm -hmm. Uh, of what you want to taste and see in the instrumentation. Yeah. In that case, was were you, was that in the finished packaged product? It was. It's, it's one of those things where our panel's going to pick it up, no one else will. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff are things that we're going to taste because we're tasting these beers every day, sometimes several times a day. So we know our beers very well. The average consumer is not going to pick it up. Yeah. Um, not saying that they're wrong, they just don't drink, hopefully they don't drink this beer so much as we do, because that's a problem. Let, let, uh, let, it, let it sit around at room temperature a little bit, and mm -hmm. some of it will fade away. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but that indicator you're not going to notice. After eight of them especially, you're not going to notice. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, these things kind of work together to help us figure out those numbers. And uh, going back to the threshold thing I talked about earlier with diastole and being lower for light lagers and higher for imperial stouts, you can see where those levels are for our beer. So we know what the benchmark is. A Seattle High uh, PPM 5 to 10 is kind of the threshold for taste. For our beers, we've seen some as much as 30 or 40 of beers that people don't taste in bigger beers. Uh, for some reason, Pachanga is much harder to taste in High than it is in Sunlight. Sunlight, you start tasting around 5 PPM, Pachanga is closer to 12. Huh. Uh, I don't know why, it doesn't make any sense, but that's the facts. Yeah. So it's kind of neat to know Sol what sulfur, sulfur notes in sulfur Pachanga too. probably yep. works perhaps that's working with it, so mm -hmm. it takes a higher level to come through as clear yeah. a seed out of high. Yeah, a little more hops in Pachanga too. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, but yeah, that's kind of, uh, this is end game. I mean, if you open a brewery and buy, this first thing you buy, you're doing it wrong. This is not equipment everyone needs right away. This is much more for yeah, so facilities that are producing the same beer eight times a week. You know? Yeah, so two things. Um, a, uh, an Indiana brewery, uh, I'm not sure what your situation is now with the uh, the guild. Yeah, me either. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're in a pandemic here, yeah. recording this, so the guild's uh, almost defunct, I think, at the moment. Not sure. Anyway, conversation for another day. But uh, the guild was providing a certain amount of uh, testing, um, regardless of whether the guild allows that for, uh, as part of your dues. 
or if you just send these uh, samples in uh, to Sun King, uh, they can test them for a fee. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a price sheet for that. So talk about your testing capabilities for other people, mm -hmm. and then also talk about uh, what you can do yourself. Is there anything you can do yourself to track some of this data? Maybe just sensory data. Sure. But track something. Oh, sure, 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 sure. So, if you Dave, are you just say hello? No, I test this. Hi, hi, sure. Yeah, yeah. Say hi. Hey, Dave. everybody. We're, we're recording, we're live. So, good to see you. Good to see you too. I'll get out of your hair. No, Cheers. you're good. <laughs> Is that supposed to be a cult mask? Uh, I'm from northern. <laughs> Yeah. Is there four and one vertical? We'll give you a pass <laughs> and just beat them and just beat the bears. Yeah. The bears. It it you beat the bears. Yeah. We're not gonna get into that. Yeah. It's all right. Then. It yeah. happens. We love you. Anyways. This is five, right? Uh, okay. Where were right. we? Anyway. Uh, so lab services. Anything yeah, you lab, saw? Lab services and what people can do yeah. on their own. Anything that you saw us do during this, we can do for everybody else. We do, we do charge a fee. Uh, there are independent labs out there that do the same kind of beer testing for people. We're about half that price because we only service pretty much people local to the area. Uh, yeah. Drop off your sample. It, through the guild, when that ever gets started again, uh, it, there's an anonymous option. So if you don't want us to know it's your beer, uh, again, I'm not the type of guy to go on Facebook and start yelling at people for having too much to see all ahead in the beer. That's just not my style. So everything here is 100% confidential. Nothing, no results, leave this space. Uh, other than to the person that dropped off the beer themselves. But if you are concerned, you can get the samples to the guild. They will relabel them, give them their own number, their own packaging, send them to us as just a number. I send the results back to them, and they send the results back to you. So there's that, they play as the middleman to make sure that it's I don't know what's going on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you don't care, uh, which most people don't, most people just drop the samples off directly. It's a, lot, it's a lot better to be able to be open and mm -hmm. communicate with you directly if there is a problem. Right. And yeah. talk about it. To, to correct it rather than be in a silo and try to be private. Sure, yeah. And like I said, we're not, I'm not trying to bring anybody down. We're, yeah. We want better beer for everybody because the better the beer is around here, the better Indianapolis looks and the more people want yep. to come here to drink good beer. So, uh, but yeah, any, any tests we saw in here, any micro stuff, any microbial checks, or if you want to check ABV, IBUs, color, all those metrics, uh, we are very good at ABV. We do that for a lot of people. Um, which, which one tests IBUs? I've used is this one. The first one. The first okay. one, yeah. yeah. ABV is on this guy. It's actually, we have a smaller one that is his brother, basically, that we just used for, for ABV. A little bit quicker than doing this one. one over there. Yeah. This yeah. is just a guest photograph with a different type of detector, but it's just a lot quicker, a lot cheaper to use than this whole setup. Okay. So. All right. I'll give a shot of that in a second. Yeah. Yeah. IBUs, I think, is something uh, more people either, they either need to check it or they need to trust their palate more. We, we find IBUs are best for hopulizations of your system themselves. Yeah. So you, if you take your system and you're calculating IBUs, it's good to get, you know, do a beer with a single hop addition or maybe two hop additions, figure out what your calculated value is, get it tested, and see how close the, those utilization numbers actually are. That's what we use it and, for. And that, that way yeah. you can then, uh, you, can, you can use your software mm -hmm. But know how to compensate for your equipment. Exactly. Yeah. Because the software is the software. The software is telling you a baseline for this volume and this boil time and, and all this. But yeah. you get to commercial scales and whirlpools take longer. I mean, yeah. so I've had people say, oh, I only used hops in the whirlpool. We didn't have any in, in, the, in right. the bittering. So, you know, it, it's uh, my software says it's only, you know, 10 IBUs. And you yeah. taste it, and it's like clearly that's almost fifty. <laughs> yeah. Um, so people have to learn either send it in for testing, yep. or just trust your dang palate. Yeah. I mean, yep. we're, we we've all been in this and doing this long enough. Uh, you should be able to taste a beer and, and get within five IBUs just on uh, how it feels. It. Yeah. So uh, the burn software, anyway. Yeah. It's just a rough estimation. And then your system is going to make all the differences in the world 100%. to your utilization, what you actually got. Yep. So use your palate. If you don't trust your palate, send it in for testing. Mm -hmm. Between the two, figure out what your system's doing. Yep. 
and uh, and then go from there. Yeah. Because these big systems, and the bigger the system, the more complicated it gets because it takes so much longer, mm -hmm. perhaps, to go through a whirlpool, and it's still up near boiling. Right. If it takes 45 minutes to go through boiling, just a hot solution, you're getting extra 45 you, minutes by you, use. Yeah. You're, it's like boiling for two hours. Yeah. Or something, you know. Yeah. So. Anyway, interesting stuff. Yeah. Send it in, get it tested. What can people do if they don't have all this fancy equipment uh, and they don't want to send everything in for testing, but they still want to track stuff? Maybe just. Yeah, it depends on. Honestly, it's it's hard for me to give advice to lab setups just because our lab is designed for Sun King beers. We're that we're a production brewery that's producing thirty some thousand barrels a year, and ninety five percent of that are are now six house beers. So if you're a brewery that's making different beers every week. It's a lot harder to develop a system because you're looking at different beers every week. So we're tracking, for us, our big concern is tracking quality consistency from batch to batch to batch of the same style of beer. For someone that's making all specialty beers, uh, it's, it's just a little different. Yeah. So it's really, you really got to tailor your, your system and your setup to the brewery that you are or the brewery that you want to be. Um, I think micro is something that's universal. You need to know that you have a clean product unless you're, unless you're doing all wild beers, which is like microbiology. Yes, yeah, our microbiology, yep. That was the uh, plating and... Plating, you even did that little broth I mentioned, the H yep. HLP broth, if you weren't concerned about bacteria. But again, if you're a farmhouse brewery or doing all wild beers, then don't worry about it. So it just depends. Yeah. Chemistry but, wise... Uh, but I, but I, I do tell people, if yeah. they don't have all this equipment though, at least do a sensory panel. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And have have a have five people yeah. on, on staff or friends or yeah. uh, area judges or someone, pay them if you need to. Mm -hmm and uh, have them come in and, and help you on a regular basis to baseline your beers and yep. identify issues and then track all this stuff so that if you're getting too much acid out of high, you can correct that mm -hmm. and, and have uh, a chart showing what you've done, at least from a sensory standpoint, at least the right. tasting part of it. Would you agree? 100%. And the thing with sensory panel too is don't take it personally. If you're telling someone, hey, taste our beer, give me feedback. If they don't say this is the greatest beer in the world, don't be upset by it. Yeah. Uh, listen to what people say about it. Our panel is a blind panel. I throw in beers from other breweries or home brews or whatever just to make sure people don't assume everything they taste is a sucking beer, just so I know we get honest feedback. And I've seen some mean comments about the beers we have made from people that actually made the beer itself, which is great because then we're going to go back and say, hey, why, why, why did this suck? Why did no one like this beer? And then next time we can fix it. So it's, it's, you know, no one likes hearing your beer is bad, but a lot of times if you're open to that criticism, you use that feedback, unless it's someone out untapped who's saying this IPA is too hoppy or why is this beer sour, um, which is super annoying. But it's always best to be open-minded with feedback from your staff with train panels, from judges, consumers for, to some extent, but uh, just be open to that and take some, you know, take some feedback. Take it serious. Yeah. You, you want to talk? Real quick about the sensory stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I get it. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. Next yep. time, we'll yep. talk about the sensory panel. Thanks so much, Kevin. Yeah, no problem, guys. All right. Bye.